well, I'm overwhelmed by everyone being here. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to talk about scale, um, although uh, the abstract, if you, if you read it, what I submitted was very specifically scaling up CDC, uh, which I will talk about. But just, just a heads up, I'm going to talk a little bit more broadly as well what, what it means to um, scale up, or at least how I look at it, um, and why that in turn means we have to shift left with our DBT models. Um, so a little bit about me first. Uh, my name is Shantana Tuli. I uh, work as uh, head of data at Upsolver. We are a data movement solution for moving your, uh, helping you get your prod data, data out of your prod environment into your analytics environments or other down, uh, downstream use cases. And a little bit further more about me. I live in Northern Virginia near Washington DC with my partner, my puppy, and my chickens. Um, so that, that's uh, me in a nutshell. I, um, I'm also very available on LinkedIn and stuff. So if you, if you do want to keep in touch, please find me, connect with me. OK, so this is what's on the agenda. Uh, we're going to talk about what even is scale um, and what I mean when I say prod. Uh, we'll talk about the pain of inheriting data, so being downstream consumers. <coughs> Um, and then we'll talk about data quality a little bit. It seems a little bit disjointed, but it'll make more sense as we go through the presentation um, and why data quality is a journey. Um, and then we'll actually talk about ingesting data from prod databases using CDC and uh, scaling up DBT to do so when the CDC, uh, when the prod data is very large. Okay, so what even is scale? I wanted to do more of an accent there, but then I decided against it. So. Um, okay, so this is, uh, this is how I think about scale. Scale to me is robustness. Um, scaling can apply to processes, right? I have a process that works, um, but now I need to scale, out, scale that out to other team members or other teams or other use cases. Um, it could be that. It could be scaling out my pipelines, again, because I have more use cases, so I just need to um, run similar pipelines more, so I might need to make artifacts out of my pipeline so that they're more um, easy to sort of glue together. Um, and then almost always scale has to do with scaling out the impact or the value that my product provides. Because ultimately, as we're growing as companies, um, our, our, the reason we want to scale up is because we're, we're uh, having more influx of users and the value that they're getting, and we want to keep at pace with that. Um, in the case of data, we generally mean an increased data volume that we need to scale up our pipelines or our processes to react to. But I think that there's a little bit of echo. Maybe it's fine, but I can hear it. <laughs> um, but I think for me, scaling up data is also be scale, uh, being robust to data volume changes. So you don't just want to uh, say, okay, I have you know, 10x more data now than last month, um, so I need everything to work at 10x more capacity. You actually want to be able to scale up and down and adjust to the actual uh, volume or velocity of your data. So to me, scale is synonymous with uh, robustness. Robust, robust architectures will scale up when needed, but will, um, uh, don't, will not waste resources when there isn't the need. Um, and then the other piece of scale that I want to touch on is scaling developer experience. So this might be a little bit of a, um, a different perspective. But um, the way I see it, as a developer, as an analytics engineer, or as a data scientist, um, what makes me scale the best is when I can extend uh, my enjoyability of my work to more. What does that mean? What does more mean, right? So as an example, like DBT, we're all here, we love DBT. Um, and one of the things that DBT brings, and I'll talk more about this uh, also, is kind of makes um, generating pipelines as configuration easy. Like once you have that initial setup, it makes it easy. So it's, you know, it's a nice user experience. And when I have that, I don't want to step out of that and into a less nice user experience tool to do some part of my job. Ideally, I can, I can do all of my job in tools that I enjoy, and that will inevitably make me faster and happier as a developer. Um, it also, uh, if I can scale my developer uh, or development experience, it also means increasing my ownership. So I am not just narrowly focused on one part of the data lifecycle, but I am accessing more, I'm owning more, and that 
um, ultimately, like it helps the workflow better, it helps the data flow better because it's not having to you know, move between systems, but ultimately, the biggest impact of that for me is that context is preserved. What do I mean by that? If I can start seeing my data and working with my data further upstream, I can gather more context about the upstream systems that the data is coming from, wh what it's been through, what's happened to it through the process. And then I can, if I'm doing my job well, I can preserve that context and send it down even when I'm uh, handing it all, like when I'm delivering my data products to someone else, it will still have that relevant context. Okay, um, so now let's talk about prod. I actually, I like using prod as opposed to production because I think it like just holds a lot more meaning. Like it, it, yes, it started as a short form of production, but um, you know, now we have words like productionize and this and that. But when I say prod, I think everyone imagines a prod environment <laughs> and, and the data that uh, that produces. So what is prod data? Um, let me actually pause here and ask, um, are we uh, mostly analytics engineers here? Are we analyzing our prod data? Is that one of our sources? Some nods. Okay, yeah, great. Um, so, so you know, prod, is, uh, prod data is my first party uh, application data that I have deployed in production that my end users are using, interacting with, um, and the, uh, the data that that generates is my prod data. It's very differentiated, right? No one else is going to have that data because it's my system, it's my service, it's my uh, you know database. So you know even if they use the same technologies, the data is going to be different. That's one of the ways in which um, it's differentiated, and it's really important to capitalize on that differentiation because that's also going to uh, let me make better decisions about my business because it's my business data and how my users are interacting with it. Um, so there are two sources, um, two main, two, two main ways, in, uh, ways in which the prod data comes out and we want to capture it. One is um, the actual um, OLTP databases, operational databases that are powering my application, um, that are processing the transactions that are happening as users navigate um, in, in the application and keeping all the relevant entities um, sort of up to date. So as an, uh, as an example, um, if I have an e-commerce um, business, I have, you know, I have to, uh, I have inventory and I have uh, prices on, on every item and when someone goes in and adds something to their checkout um, and, or, or checks out with it, um, I have to make sure that the payment is being processed properly, that the bank confirms and, um, and then they actually, you know, it triggers the, the set of things that needs to happen for them to get shipped those events and so on and so forth. So my database keeps track of, you know, this person, um, their orders, um, their, their checkout and all of those details. The second source is events. So interaction events, as my user interacts with uh, uh, the, the application, uh, they might be uh, being sent out in me message queues, right? So Kafka streams, Kinesis streams, et cetera. These are API events that are triggered, again, by the user flow. So those are the two types of data that um, I think of when I think of prod data. Um, and it's also what we mean uh, at Upsolver when we talk about it. Um, okay. Did I miss this? Okay. Data development. So again, the DBT effect was that analytics workflows could be productionized like other assets and other, other workflows. Uh, automation, repeatability, I can do incremental development and deployment. I can test my transformation code better. Um, and it's more process based. I, you know, some, if a new member joins or just another member has to um, get pull and then like have to raise has to raise uh, pull requests and stuff. So it's all kind of more um, organized and structured, right? Which is much 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 better than the ad hoc queries in someone's Snowflake worksheet or something like that. Um, but there are some limitations, um, and I don't know yet. Obviously, because it's all new, I don't know yet how much of the of yesterday's announcements affects uh, this this slide, but. Um, there are limitations, so a uh, project is going to run on a single engine, so the, there is no cross-platform communication within a project, um, and we're limited to transformations. So th those are the two big things, and real-world workflows, data workflows, 
uh, are going to extend beyond the transformation and are definitely going to extend beyond um, a single platform. So this is, let's talk about real world data workflows for a sec. This is a GIF that has a lot going on and I just liked it because it's moving. Um, but only, I, I just really wanna, um, you don't have to pay attention to all of it. But this, and also this is very enterprisey. But whatever the data sources may be, they come in and they go through this data ingestion process. There are uh, governance workflows. And then we sort of get the data in a lake or a warehouse and we do the analytics and so on and so forth. As you can see, it's like just a part of a much larger data workflow, first off. Um, and secondly, it's downstream of all of these other things as well. And, um, so when we sit here, if we're analytics engineers, we're sitting here, then the, that, uh, to get the context, we do have to go through all of these all the way back. And often, though not always, um, there are handoffs. There are handoffs between, so if I say um, some of these things here might be my prod sources, um, someone else, maybe the software engineer is pushing that out to us. Maybe a data engineer is then do, is actually in charge of the data ingestion. Um, and there are just many steps where things can fall through the cracks and context can go missing. Let's look at a more simplified version. This is a, a graphic by uh, Five Trend, and it's um, like it's pretty. Uh, uh, it, it hits it on the nail, uh, hits the nail on the head with sort of the you know taking it down and bringing it down to the basics, right? So we've got da uh, four main. Uh, data sources, this is how I think about it as well. Uh, so we've got the databases, et cetera, um, and then we have SaaS applications as well, which is a different kind of data, third-party data, not prod. And then we do extract load, and then it gets into the data warehouse, transformation, analyze, analytics. And we kind of tend to just like say extract load and then move on, because we just live downstream of it. But there's actually a lot that happens in that process, a lot, a lot that happens in that, uh, before that T uh, phase. Um, just This is just an example, so if I have my operational sources, it's going into, it's being staged, I have to think about how my data is gonna be optimally stored in my stage, um, how my data is gonna be partitioned, where else it needs to go, so you, know, you don't always send it to one uh, analytic source, right? And you might send it to Snowflake as well as Teradata, as well as something else. So those things, someone is in charge of it, but often there's a wall and that someone is on this side and we're on this side of that wall, on the analytics side. Uh, and one of the things that this affects when someone else is doing um, all of this is data quality. So let's talk a little bit about data quality. Um, there, there are many choices that we make um, upstream that affect properties or attributes of the data downstream that are sort of, uh, again, like these choices are just made. So here's an example, backfilling. Let's say there was a disaster or some downtime, for some reason some data went missing, as an example, or for some reason I needed to do backfilling. Who is making that decision? Why I, I don't have power sitting downstream as an analytics engineer to say, hey, I need to rerun this or I need this, but often I don't have that power. Data freshness. I might have a use case that requires five hours freshness, but I don't have a way to communicate that upstream, and someone upstream has decided you're gonna get this data every 24 hours. Right? This is, of course, a more a cultural um, thing than a technological thing, and that's the point, right? These problems are usually cultural, but nonetheless, they're reality. Like, this is something that someone else is deciding uh, for me. Um, ordering. Uh, especially with uh, prod data, event queues, and so on and so forth. Um, what order are the events coming in? Uh, am I getting a, am I deciding to ship a thing out in the retail example? Am I deciding to ship something out before the bank transaction has actually gone through, right? I don't have control over how the data um, is ordered. Um, and then there's like the more straightforward um, example of deduplication. Who deduplicates data and when? If I discover when in a dash, or if my users, just consumers discover um, a, you know, a duplicate record or something that's affected by a duplication, I not only have to fix that data asset, but I have to think about the other data assets or products that that has affected, and I have to fix all of those, and then ideally I go back to staging and fix it there as well, and then I raise it upstream also. So it's a lot of steps when it gets to that, as opposed to if I am working at ingestion, and I can just say, hey, I'm deduplicating now, then it's you know, one and done. Um, 
And then finally, data, we talk about data con contracts these days a lot, data schema, right? Who decides the schema? How do you know um, which fields are gonna be important for me for the deliverables that folks are asking for? Like, am I being invited into the room to say, okay, this is, uh, you know, th uh, this team is interested in this, these stakeholders are interested in the other things, and I need all these attributes, um, and which of those uh, have security concerns? Which of those, I know that, okay, this should not be null, so if it is, please, like, some, <laughs> something seriously off. These communications. So these are all, today, still happening kind of upstream of analytics, that that's the thing that I wanna, I wanna break down that wall and bridge. What do I have next? Um, and then finally, watching, just watching the data. Um, data, different dimensions, right? We often see data or experience data as a table, two-dimensional table. There are records, there are fields, uh, but there's also a temporal um, aspect to data, obviously. Even if it's not time series, right? There is um, historical data, the context is very important. I want to know what the volume has been, how it's changed, and so on and so forth. So that observability, uh, which again, I can start observing it immediately. I don't have to wait until it's in my warehouse and you know, I, have, I put on an observab observability tool on top of it. Okay, so the long and short of it is that data quality is a journey. Um, it's, you can't just sprinkle little bits here and there and say, okay, I have high quality data products. You sort of have to be consistent. You gotta start at the beginning and follow through to delivery. Okay. Now, back to ingesting uh, prod databases. So the process is uh, see, change data capture. Are we more or less familiar with change data capture? Yeah, okay. Many people are, some aren't. Um, so I talked about one of the sources of, of prod data was a database, um, and change data capture is a process through which we replicate that database. Why do we want to replicate prod databases? Well, uh, as analytics engineers, we want to analyze um, this data, so we wanna run queries on it. But if I were to run my analytics queries against my prod um, database, that would be bad, bad news because that would slow down my actual application, it would miss, uh, cause me to miss SLAs, and my users would be unhappy. So that's the why. And then the how is that as the, operation, as, as the transactions are being processed, the operational databases, the, there are different techniques and different databases will do it differently, but they essentially they write out a log, a change log of those events happening, and we basically receive those change logs and then reconstruct the um, entities and, and what, what state they're currently in. So you should have a replica, very close replica in your analytics environment to your prod. Um, so why is scale and issue with prod. I've mentioned it a couple times. Um, I think if we're working primarily or um, if we're working a lot with SAS data, third party data, then we're used to data being a certain size. Okay, let's say I have 300 customers and I have these 300, 400 attributes per customer and I'm, I'm used to that like data set. Um, with prod, it, I think it can be a little bit mind-boggling sometimes just how much bigger the data can get. So this is a Candy Crush example, right? Apparently, um, <laughs> the average user um, uh, is on the app for 38 minutes every day, um, which, is, which is a lot. So and you're playing the data, it's generating a, a lot of data. Then there is, and that, that data would be captured in the Candy Crush uh, application database. Um, then there are IoT applications and, uh, and architectures where you have the same database design, but the physical, like it, it's actually in different places. And so you have to consume from all of those different databases and consolidate that knowledge to make, for it to make sense. So it, it can grow. Um, it depends on how many users are actually interacting with my product, um, what are the transaction types that they can do, what are the different entities that my application has to keep track of, um, how many tables does that mean, how many databases, so on and so forth. And a lot of uh, CDC solutions, unfortunately, um, require you to do uh, per table pipeline, which is super annoying because you have to say, okay, this is a, a table, in this is my orders table in this database, I have a pipeline to capture the data from there and put it into Snowflake. And then you have to do it again for items or something like that. So that is something that is clearly not scalable when you have hundreds or even thousands of tables. 
Okay, so I think we can solve this by using dbt at ingestion with the right engine. Um, so this is the idea of, of shifting left dbt, right? So here I'm showing um, a, a dbt model that I have running right now. It's taking data from a Postgres database, which I uh, connected to in another dbt model, and it's writing data to my Snowflake database using leveraging the Snowflake connection. And all I'm having to do here is I'm telling you um, telling how to load the data, so it's an incremental model, um, and I can actually specify what to do when the schema changes. So this is another really powerful thing, is what happens when there are new columns? You can, set, you can say ignore it, you can say append it, you can, say, you can specify what you want to do with it. Um, and then uh, there are some other um, attributes that I can set, so again, uh, adding missing columns or not. And I don't have to, uh, if you know, create table if missing, true. So I don't actually have to go into Snowflake and you know, run a bunch of create table commands that create empty tables to write data into. This job, uh, this model, will actually create those tables for me, no matter how big the uh, data source is. So yeah, I think that's pretty cool. Um, write interval, uh, et cetera. I can even decide how to partition it and so, on, uh, and, and so forth. So just with a few lines of config code, what I've done is I've scaled my dev experience from just transformation to ingestion as well. Um, I've scaled, so now my, through this one engine, I'm uh, actually connecting to you know, two different uh, a source and a target, and I, there are many more um, pieces of software that I can uh, reach to, and uh, most importantly, I've scaled out uh, the ownership. So I can now work with the data from the source, from the CDC database, all the way through to the delivery of my data products. Okay, so TLDR, scale is about uh, data volume increase and also variability, schema evolution, uh, being robust to schema evolution, data type changes, et cetera. It's also about de developer enjoyment. I can't emphasize this enough. I don't want to work in a tool that I don't enjoy working in. So being able to uh, extend my DBT experience is very important. Um, and then data workflows, of course, go beyond uh, just the transformations and go uh, cross-platform. So we need to um, and uh, like we need to build to that as well. Um, and uh, so we need high-quality data. Uh, products need ownership. Prod data can get quite big, uh, but it's super important to understand my business. And the solution is to perform change data capture with a tool that, uh, or with an, an engine under dbt that has quality uh, and robustness um, and scaling built into it. Um, that's it. We're, um, we have a, we're throwing our data happy hour tonight. It's called Data Maverick. Um, you can meet us there. I am around and I'll be you know, in the expo hall near the Absolver booth, or if you wanna come up and talk to me about exactly how to get this running. You can, you can get this running in minutes. Uh, free Absolver account, um, dbt integrator, open source. Um, get it set up and immediately start ingest, uh, ingesting data. That's it, thank you. Hi. Hi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.